He'll make it for sure. Now that's why I backed him on Tap Touch. Hey, Luke. Yes, Gene Simmons. He's probably the best when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Gene. You've got the touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call 1 800 858 858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Hello and welcome to Hoop Sevens Basketball Hustle. And we might not have had any any basketball in the NBL to talk about this week, but that doesn't mean we're short on topics to talk about. And I'm joined by my two co hosts this week. So. That'll mean I take a back seat and let them go through things and give you their thoughts. So I'm Chris Pike, but I'm joined by both Cody Ellis and Simon Mitchell, and we're going to go through the first eight rounds of the NBL. We'll give our thoughts on what we expect to see for the rest of the NBL season, give give some thoughts on how each team has progressed. Might even have a chat about retired jerseys now that Damien Martin's number's going up into the rafters in, in Perth and see who might be next for, for each team. So then we'll have round nine to, to look forward to. So that's plenty for us to cover. First of all, Cody, good to be back, and feeling nervous with Simon on the other on the other end of the line. Oh yeah, look, it's it's obviously uh, we've we've gotten to a bit of a routine with with just you and I uh, having a chat, and obviously Simon was uh, good enough to fill in for me a couple of times with with yourself. So no, look, I'm excited. It's going to be a, a good hour ahead, I think. Simon, thanks for joining us. How, how's how's life treating you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, you know, the weather's starting to pick up here in Melbourne. It's always a little bit behind the rest of the country outside, has it? So, yeah, that looks good. Well, we've had almost 40 degree days over the last last week or so, so yeah, you do have miserable. a bit of catching up to do. You probably don't miss those Perth trips. How did you find the trips to Perth? No, I loved it. I love Perth. Uh, I think it's a beautiful city. Love the love the trips to Scarborough Beach. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, uh, we used to spend, spend a little bit of time out at, Cody's old hunting ground with uh, when we go to shoot around as well. So we'd go out to the um, to, to the Mike's old house yeah, <laughs> and get yeah. stuff up there. So, so yeah, no, it was always a good trip. Um, you know that you get in the Red Army, and uh, yeah, that was always it was always fun. Um, yeah, I think there's only one time I didn't. Enjoy, well, there's been a couple of times I haven't enjoyed it, but that was sort of because we got our asses kicked. But, <laughs> um, especially, yeah, especially one time, main build. I think went from forty on us and, and, and hit ten trees. And, Bad, and I think that first year at FTM Phoenix, uh, I think we were three and zero, and and had a reality trip to Perth, and then got pumped and sent over the far between our legs, and uh, yeah, recovering was tough after that. But um, yeah, the only other time I can remember not enjoying Perth was um, we had some blokes next to the bench who were absolutely hammered, and uh, I had to sit next to them, and I was every time they yell at me, they were spitting, and they were, they were just involved with the whole game, and yeah, it was, I don't think they let those blokes turn up drunk anymore, but uh, they're still obnoxious. <laughs> People sit next to the bench quite often. There's a famous heckler, Simon Devlin, who's a bald, bald guy that's been doing it for a long time. Did he, did he ever get hold of you? Uh, I don't a- think I ever... Like, yeah, I think he sat behind our yeah, bench, he, yeah, he and I think I only ever heard him once. So he's not working these uh, magic like he used to. <laughs> no, he, yeah. he's the one no, famously I, that got under homicide skin, and the one that homicide ran and showed his jersey to after that final win for Townsville. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the heck. It doesn't take a lot of imagination or courage to be that bloke. So yeah, he's he's a bit of a coward in my book. But anyway, <laughs> that's uh, that's the way I live. No, that, we're definitely not here to talk about talk about cowards. You talked about Mike Ellis's old house at Warwick Stadium. Did you ever get invited over to the famous Ellis family pool that all the, especially the Illawarra Hawks guys, all enjoyed visiting when they came to Perth? Uh, no, I, I don't know about the famous uh, <laughs> Ellis pool. What's the, what's the story behind this one? Oh, no, look, whenever we'd, uh, especially with the Hawks, whenever we'd come back to Perth, the uh, mum and dad would, would invite us around for a, a bit of a feast and, and to jump in the pool and uh, just kind of hang out a bit. Uh, straight off the plane, which was uh, always a bit nicer than, than going straight to the courts. But, uh, yeah, no, it became a bit of a tradition. Oh, that's a nice one, a nice one. It should be more of that. It'd be great if, uh, if we did that in, you know, in each city if uh, we had people that we could hook up with and just sort of go get a feast. Because it's, uh, you get sick of the restaurants on the road. Yeah. You certainly do. We used to do it uh, when we'd go to Adelaide. We'd go to the foreman's place um, yeah. for dinner. And, uh, yeah, look, it was uh, – Always a lot better than the restaurants. I uh, have to agree with you there. 
Did you catch the back end of Mike's career, Simon? Did in your early days at Melbourne, did you play against Mike at all? Nah, no. Nah, I um, I remember Mike. I didn't. I didn't play against Mike. I, I went to college in '92, and I didn't play NBL. So I played at Melbourne Tigers um, BBA. Yep. So it was with all the NBL ones, but uh, Ray Gordon never played on the Wednesday night, so I used to get a gig. Um, so. Yeah, and then I went to college. I didn't play after that, but uh, I, I remember Mike really well um, as, as a young fella. When, when um, you know, sort of, unfortunately, well, the people of Perth probably don't remember Perth not being a good basketball team, but I do. Um, and, uh, and and Mike was one of the uh, one of the outstanding players on those teams, and a heavy scorer too. I think people forget that he, he was actually a bucket. And then, obviously, as the All Stars rolled into town, um, his role changed quite a bit. And um, you know, which, which is a real tip of the hat to Mike and what he's able to achieve. Like he, he really could fill any role. And any given night, it was certainly. Yeah, you know, he was knocked down, but um, you know he wasn't quite the heavy scorer he was as a young fella. He, he was really just so, rock solid, um, and and he supported the elite talent. Um, and uh, yeah, tremendous basketballer, a tremendous player. Does he tell you about what a scorer he was all the time, Cody? Oh, I've heard every story under the sun <laughs> multiple times, so don't worry about that. Yeah, look, he, he certainly. Um, I mean, looking back, and I've been able to watch a bit of game film from mm-hmm. from back in the days, as grainy and as bad as it was. <laughs> But uh, no, look, he used to be able to kind of do it all on the court. So yeah, look, there uh, hasn't really been a day gone by where he doesn't remind me of that, so, which, is, which is fair enough. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get down to, down to business, guys. That's, what's been our impression on the NBL season so far now that we've had a, a sort of a week to, to look back on it all? Firstly, from your point of view, Simon, having been involved so heavily for so many years as a coach and you know, being involved in, in a day-to-day environment as an assistant as the, and then as a head coach... Um, What's it been like for you to sit back and and watch the league go on from from the outside? Uh, it's actually been a real pleasure to, to, to view it through a different lens um, for the first time in a long, long time. I, I think the first eight rounds of the of the season, um, I, I was just watching it for pleasure. I had no real investment other than wanting to see certain coaches do well or certain players do well, or or even a club that might be down its luck just get a win or, or something like that. You know, like, there's there's no real heavy investment there, and just the the, the spectacle of the game, the comp- the competition. I just really enjoyed it until last round. <laughs> and then for some reason, I think it was the, the, the Phoenix loss to Adelaide and then the Melbourne win over Sydney yeah. with these unbelievable turnarounds. Something tweaked in me where I'm like, oh, I've got to find the answers to what happened here. Um, instead of just watching the game and go and find answers, I'm looking for body language, looking for plays, where did it all go wrong and all these sorts of things. And so I started cutting film for the first time since the grand final series last year. Um, and, basically haven't stopped since, uh, <laughs> since those games. I've, I've been you know, going through games looking for, for more and more information as to, as to how teams are travelling. So, yeah, I mean, for the first eight rounds, it was just pure bliss watching basketball. And this last round, um, I guess the itch maybe came back to just delve in a little bit deeper. Well, I was going to bring that up at, up at some stage during the show. This might be as good a time as any, Simon. I think on the first show we did together, you talked about how as a coach in this in this league, you probably can't afford to be out too long. I mean, do you feel like you have that? Is that itch getting strong enough where you would potentially look for a job in the league for next season? Uh, would I look for one? Yeah, you know, I, I'd certainly consider anything that, that came my way. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the league. I certainly would look overseas also. But at the same time, I am enjoying life I'm leading at the moment and having my weekends to, well, I still sit and watch basketball, but I don't have to be anywhere to do it. So I, I am enjoying that a little bit. But yeah, I think the itch is, is starting to return a little bit. And yeah, I mean, as I said, like since that, that last weekend or since the last round, I've just been sort of cutting film feverishly, trying to trying to find out a little bit more information about players and teams and how they're operating. Last show we did, you talked about how you hope that the Hawks could pull together for Jacob Jacomas because you wanted to see him do well, but unfortunately since then he's lost his job. That means there is a job available. Is, does the Illawarra Hawks job, is that a position that would at all appeal to you looking to next season? Uh, I, I, not on the surface, no. Yep, okay. I, I, and that's not to say I wouldn't entertain the idea, mm-hmm. but I, I have a, a pretty 
deep shopping list of questions to ask um, of the organisation and, and how they operate and what their plans are for the future, what's their community engagement, all these sorts of things. I just don't know a lot about how the, how the club operates. Um, so, yeah, look, I hadn't even really thought about it. I was asked a, a couple of times after after Jacob um, was dismissed if, if I'd heard anything or has anyone spoken to me, and, and the answer no. Um, so, so my interest might be matched by their interest. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it might be the, the perfect mismatch of, of not getting together. So, yeah, look, I haven't heard anything. And, um, yeah, look, uh, having said that, um, as Katie would attest to, Illawarra is one beautiful city and some of the best beaches you'll come across in Australia. So it is a wonderful place. It's one of my favourite places to visit, but uh, I've never aspired to living there. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Katie? Hey. Oh, absolutely. If I was to, again, to live anywhere else in Australia, it'd probably be back in Wollongong. I uh, absolutely loved it in there. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, you're not the Lone Ranger there in uh, in your shopping list of, of questions to ask about the club in general. And look, obviously, I was part of it for three years and it was all over the shop, to be perfectly honest. And they've moved on from that uh, kind of era that they had there. Mm. Um, and I think they're certainly looking up a bit. But uh, look, there's still lots going on clearly behind the scenes that, that need, need some work. The biggest question I've got is who's making the decision on who's signing players? And we've talked about how, how do you end up with such similar imports like Tyler and Justin Robinson. Right, and that's that's where it came, I guess, before Jacob really signed the, as, a, as the head coach. They, they kind of decided to sign a couple of players. Yeah. And yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a tough one, right? Because you want to be able to get the best players possible for your squad. And if you're in that middle ground of deciding who your head coach is, to get a jump on things is, is awkward because you don't know what that coach that you're going to hire what he wants to do with his squad. So I've, I've never really liked when, when teams do that. But, you know, if elite players come across your table, it's hard to say no to. What was it like at the Phoenix, Simon? Did you and Tommy have a pretty good relationship in terms of deciding between between you guys on who you would sign? Oh, yeah. No, it was, I mean, we were, we, we're still really close. Um, we talk most weeks, um, sometimes a couple of times. Um, not always about basketball, just you know, little catch up chats. But um, we we work feverishly together on, on, on recruiting, um, and I mean, ultimately, Tommy always said that's your decision. But I always seek his counsel on, on you know, if I wasn't sure. And if you're not sure, you, you're probably best to move on to the next option, anyways. But um, the habit of, of you know, like if, if we're looking to fill a point guard, I, I would spend hundreds of hours. Um, scouring film on different people and um, I, I'm a little bit of a, a junkie when it comes to that stuff and, and just trying to make sure I mean you can never get the perfect play I mean you're bound by so many things one availability budget um, and you know do they have NBA aspirations or not and and, and the fit and um, so you don't always get the people that you want but you know I was never disappointed with, with any of the players um uh, had the last choice on if we wanted them, so I couldn't be disappointed. But um, yeah, I was never disappointed with you know with the process. It was always really, really solid communication, and, and I thought we worked really well together. Talk about cutting up the tape. What's it like cutting up tape for the Phoenix after being their their only head coach up until this season? What's it like now cutting up tape, knowing that somebody else is in charge? Um, oh no, it's fine. Oh, I. I, I do it you know, as I said. I, I've done it for a few, quite a few games, and, and not necessarily Phoenix. Um, I've only done a one Phoenix game, um, so yeah, no, it's really just to try and get inside the mind of of, of the the coaches on, on what they're trying to achieve at times, um, and, and 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 just looking at habits of players. Um, you know, like if, if that phone call should ever come, um, you know, between now and the start of next season and, and it's an entertaining offer and it fits my family and all those sorts of things. I want to make sure that I'm across the league and, and, and everything that's happening in it. Um, I don't want to come in. And even though I watch every single game and, and you know, I follow the league pretty closely, um, I just, I have that, um, I guess it's a, a need to, to, to know that I've worked harder than anybody else in the room to get to understand what's happening. And, and so I do spend that time and, and I've quite enjoyed it, as I've said the last week, of just uh, trying to get inside the heads of some of the coaches and, and what they're trying to achieve. Well, we talked a little bit last week about both those games that you, you looked at, the second the second half turnarounds from from Adelaide against South East and then Melbourne over, over Sydney. I mean, I, I guess the answer is probably a long answer, but can you sum up how Melbourne was able to turn things around on Sydney and how Adelaide did it to, to the Phoenix? 
Yeah, well, the Melbourne one was just their relentlessness. Um, I actually shared a little bit of video on, on Twitter or X or whatever they call it these days uh, after the game. I, I was just fascinated, so I jumped straight in and called up some friends and got a copy of the game and uh, and then started cutting away at it. And just the, the, the effort on all of the small things, the, the things that Melbourne do, the little things that Melbourne do, they do exceptionally well. And, and like the old Wildcats teams when, when Damo was there and Sean Redditch and, they, and Jesse and those guys, um, where their, their pride in the little things, the, the being first to a loose ball, the boxing out on every single play, and, it, and, uh, and, and just putting your body on the line, it was there on every single play um, in the second half. Like they were just relentless, and I think you know they just eventually broke Sydney. Like Sydney weren't horrible, mm. unlike South East Melbourne, who were horrible. <laughs> but it, it was it was just Melbourne just broke them over time. Like just especially Shay Ely and Chris Golding made some tremendous plays. Um, took a charge in transition. Um, one rotation he, he had um, you know, towards the end of the game. I think Melbourne had probably had the game in hand at that point. But just the fact they kept playing until the buzzer, um, it was just, it was, it was great to watch. And, and as much as Shea Illy struggled this season at the offensive end, the, the hustle plays and the things that he brings to that team, he's just so a leader. And, you know, everyone says it's effort, but it, it, it does require effort, but it's also a talent. And he is one of the most talent hustle guys of all time. As you know, very similar in, in that respect to a bloke who's about to get his number in the rafters. We'll talk about a little later. But, mm. um, but yeah, I was, I was just, um, I was so impressed by Melbourne. I actually caught up with Dean Vickman during the week, and uh, and and he said like when he came in at halftime, the players had already you know, they already knew what they were doing. Dally and Chris had spoken to the team, and uh, they'd said, "Yeah, uh, Dean, we're doing A, B, C, D," and he's like, "Yep, yeah, great idea, let's go." Um, so it, it was clearly a well-oiled machine right now. Where and that's what you want as a coach. You want to uh, empower the players, and, and they are playing like they are extremely empowered. And uh, I was just tremendously impressed with the job Dean's done and, and, and the uh, the buy-in and application from everybody on that list. You talked about the Phoenix before. I mean, above everything else, though, we talked about it last week. What it showed to me was why DJ Vasilovic was so important to Adelaide. He could just put a team on his back and take over a game like he did in that second half. And the Phoenix might, might have been horrible, like, like you talked about. But sometimes if you've got a winner on your team, he can, he can just put a team on his back. Yeah, well, Lindsay Gaze used to always say, don't give a sucker an even break. And, you know, like South East Melbourne had, had that team um, in their possession. And um, he he made some really tough shots. But at the same time, the one that just troubled me, you know, the free throw, the missed free throw, and I, I stopped it, paused it. There's three guys for South East Melbourne lined up. None of them. Mm make any contact with the Adelaide guys that are um, lined up and it ends up in a tipped ball, long rebound, and that gets worked around a couple of times and then DJ hits that prayer. Now, he's just a tough shot and if he doesn't hit it, do they go on to win it? Well, who knows? Um, and, and you can probably shake your, you shake your head and say, well, geez, that's a t- he's not going to hit too many of those. Yeah. But the point is you gave him the opportunity and it wasn't just one time. Some of the offensive rebounds given up in that last quarter were just dreadful um, and, and I was I was really upset um, for Mike um, everyone knows he's a good mate of mine and, and um, yeah I just thought uh, yeah I just thought the players let themselves the club down and, and especially their coach some of the application you know quite the exact opposite to what Melbourne United showed um, I thought South East Melbourne were really poor in the last from the last three minutes of the uh second quarter to the end of the game, um, I thought at least the last two minutes, I thought they were really poor. Yeah, well, I, I feel like South East has shown kind of glimpses of that, not just in this game, but I guess throughout the season a little bit. They've, they've been so tough and so good and disciplined for quarters and then just will take, you know, a few minutes off here and there and all of a sudden the game turns on its head. So, you know, that's something that I'm sure, you know, Mike and his coaching staff are on top of. But, um, gosh, I, I definitely... I catch myself pretty much every single round watching a game and seeing little things like that, miss box outs that lead to an O board to a big three or something like that. And I just find myself yelling and screaming at the TV and that's with <laughs> absolutely you know no skin in any of these games. So it's, uh, it's certainly frustrating watching some of that sort of stuff uh, unfold. I think Katie's just revealed his, uh, his next, uh, his next job. <laughs> <laughs> He's not lying. <laughs> um, last thing in this segment and then we'll take a break and, We'll come back and have a look at how our preseason predictions are shaping up, Simon. But I, I want to get your thoughts. A two-week break like this, 
I want to get your thoughts on what it would be like for, especially Mike Kelly and Justin Shuler. So we talked talk last week. I mean, the Bullets were so close to being on a six-game winning streak. The last two minutes in their last three games, I'm sure, would be haunting him a little bit. And, and Mike, those two losses to Melbourne United and then Adelaide, I'm sure, weren't great. How tough is it to then have a break when you don't get the chance to immediately play again after after some tough losses? Yeah, look, look, it's frustrating because all you want to do is go out and rectify the situation. And you would think after the, the Melbourne United game, South East Melbourne, that first half looked like they had rectified it and then you know, rested on their oils and you know, paid the price. I think Justin's situation is probably a, a little different. Um, I think he's probably really got to focus on the positives because um, there's been so much that's gone right for Brisbane. Um, and obviously he's nursing and building and creating a new culture there. And what you don't want is a culture of negativity. And uh, I think he's got to really, you know, yes, we've got to sort out the last two minutes of a the game. There's no doubt. But there's also a lot to like about what Brisbane's doing. Mm. Now, yeah, should they have won those last six games? Well, maybe they should have. Right now, they're not good enough to do that. Mm-hmm. They're just not. Um, they haven't done it before. Uh, you know, you compare them to Melbourne. You see Melbourne, they're down 10, and you're just like, they're a chance. Yep. And, and I'm not so, so confident just at this point in time. But uh, you can see them chipping away and think, building. You, you think building. the same about Tasmania too, don't you? They're always still a chance. Yeah. No, you, re- you really do. You do. You know that they're going to make a, a, a last a last run at you. Whether they come up uh, over the top of you, you know, it's neither here nor there, but you know there's a run in them. Um, they're not going to they, – they never defeat themselves. And uh, I think Justin's just got to, yeah, I think he's just got to remain positive and tinker with those last two minutes. Southeast, uh, similar, similar in the sense that, you, you know, you don't want to be negative for two weeks. You, you can become pretty embedded in this job and you've really got to make sure the people around you uh, are, are being positive. Um, you want to make sure it's a great working environment. And if you're, if you're grumpy and negative and all those things all the time um, because bad things have happened, then, um, then, you know, it's not a nice place to be. So, Mike is one of those blokes who's just a wonderful human being, got a great sense of humour. Um, whilst he would have been disappointed, he, he also understands how this game works and he would have uh, he would have lightened the mood a little bit during the course of the week, I'm sure. All right, that's been a, been a good, fun first segment, guys. So let's take a break. We'll hear from Tab Touch and then we'll come back and go back over our pre-season predictions and, and see how we're, we're shaping up. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm here with both Simon Mitchell and, and Cody Ellis. Um, let's go back. Now that we're eight rounds into the season and we've got a little bit of a break thanks to the fever window, let's go back to our preseason predictions and see... If we're happy with what we what we said at the start, if we want to change anything, looking ahead to now the the second half of the season. So let's start with the championship winner. Um, we had Matty Knight involved in this as well, and all four of us said Melbourne United. Simon, I find it pretty hard to imagine we're not going to stick with that. Well, I'm certainly sticking with it for <laughs> now. Um, there's been no reason to change. They've, they've been a wonderful basketball team, and you know there's still plenty of upside um, in this team with. Uh, Ian Clark and Daly to return, and then obviously just meshing because you know JLA was missing for a period, and uh, yeah, just meshing all those players together, they're just going to grow from strength to strength. So um, hopefully they get a really good run at it, and they don't incur any more injuries. Which I mean, they, I'm sure they'll get one or two here or there, but just nothing major, and they can uh, they can present themselves the best life for the rest of the year. Any reason for you to change, Cody? Absolutely not. No, they're they're the team to beat right now, and you know that's definitely. After having all the injuries they've had, mm. you know, the players out constantly throughout the year, having Rob Lowe come in, step in yeah. and, and play a big part and as an injury replacement. And I mean, to have him up their sleeve going forward, if there is an injury to the he's qualified picks, for finals now too. He's, he's qualified, which is great. So look, it's, it's certainly theirs to, to lose, but yeah, they, I mean, they're just, they're so fun to watch uh, as well. So yeah, look, absolutely zero reason to change <laughs> that one. No, I, I'm the same. Um, all right, Simon, your top four at the start was obviously Melbourne. Then you had Sydney, Tasmania, New Zealand. Did you change any of that? Yeah, I might have to make a move on New Zealand. Um, I don't know who I'd replace them with, though, um, to be fair. Mm-hmm. I, I think of the top three, I think, are the top three. Um, maybe Perth, if they really get on a, you know, extend this tear. But, um, yeah, I think they've been the three most consistent teams. 
New Zealand obviously have just been smashed with injury and maybe not the most balanced roster that they could have put together either. Um, I I thought they might just overcome that, that there there might be an element of this modern basketball and having two foremen out there in in, in Finn Delaney and Chiefham um, and go without the five at times, but they, they struggled rebounding in those situations and they've struggled defensively in those situations and yeah, uh, even before the injuries. But now they've been riddled with injury. Um, Will McDowell White's just enormous. Um, and, and, and Zion Sheetham as well. So, yeah, unfortunately, I don't see New Zealand making a second half run up the ladder. Mm. Jeez, oh, I don't know. I, we haven't seen much of Cairns yet as far as their, their lineup, no, um, their full lineup. No, so. they still haven't been at full strength at all. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve. Plugging Perth into that fourth spot until I've seen what Cairns have done. So, but they're, they're the two obvious teams for me. Cody, you went Melbourne, Perth, South East Melbourne, Brisbane. Mm. Would you change any of that up? Yeah, look, probably South East and Brizzy, I think, are probably going to slot into that five and six, yeah. um, which I th- think is where they're sitting right now. Um, you'd obviously have Tassie in there. You know, they've been unbelievable. And then, you know, Sydney. You know, mm. they, they came out of the blocks – a lot better than I thought they would. Um, with, with some of their some of the injuries that they had early, I thought they might start off a little slow. Mm. But uh, no, they they had such a massive turnover and with coaching staff yeah. and and elite players that were leaders in those groups that it, it hasn't really been any let off. It's it's uh, it's been very impressive. So yeah, look, I'd, I'd definitely take out Southeast and Brizzy and then slot in Tassie and Sydney. I think I'll do similar. So I went Melbourne, Perth, New Zealand, Sydney. Unfortunately for the Breakers, I don't think they'll turn it around either. So I'd probably slot Tasmania in and that would be my my top four. Our play-in teams, Simon, you had Perth and Cairns. Um, right now you probably think one of those might slot into the top four and one of them would be in that play-in spot. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine so. Um, and then you've got, I guess, South East Melbourne and um, Brisbane. Um, and, and maybe to a lesser extent, Adelaide still mm. still pushing um, for that that final play in position. I, I don't think Adelaide have the balance nor the, the, the talent to, to to clinch that. So I, I think it's going to become between South East and Brisbane. And uh, geez, I, I hope people don't accuse me of <laughs> of putting uh, the favourites, uh, the, the, the old team, uh, overrating them. But oh, I. I Probably slot southeast. I certainly would love to see them in there, I, I, but I, I think if they can just tidy up a few things, tidy up their focus, uh, you know they can score. Yeah, I, I think they can they can slot into that uh, into that playing position. Cody, you went Sydney, New Zealand, so you've already slotted Sydney up into the top four, yep. and I imagine you'll probably take New Zealand out of that mix too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, look, I think they're just losing too many key pieces. Yep. Is is obviously frustrating, and, and Simon spoke extensively about that already. Uh, but look, Cairns, Cairns is definitely that uh, little asterisk for me because, mm. um, again, we, we haven't seen a whole lot of them. Um, for you. And, I mean, we all know what Forty does with his squads mm. and he gets them up and going no matter who he's got on the court. So, look, they're, they're certainly going to make a push, but I think I'll probably stick with putting South East and Brizzy in that five and six. Yep. Um, so originally I had Cairns in Tasmania, so I've moved the Jack Jumpers up into the top four. It's tough to judge Cairns right now, mm-hmm. like you guys have said. So I actually think Brisbane and South East as well would be my fifth and sixth team. And we're agreeing a bit too much here, guys. We, we might are. need to <laughs> mix, it, mix it up a bit. Let's get to our MVP. This might, this might be where it gets interesting because I, I genuinely think there's five candidates for the MVP right now. So I, I would put Alan Williams, Chris Golding, Bryce Cotton, um, Milton Doyle, and Jalen Adams. I think, I think all five deserve to be in that mix and... One of you guys might have someone else that I didn't even mention. So I think it's a really tough call to make right now. Simon, you went Bryce Cotton at the start of the season. Who would you have right now? I think he's, I actually got 10 names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, got, I've got 10 names of players that I think have been... I don't think there's a standout. Now, obviously, we, 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 we often go with recency bias and, and the, the red-hot form of Chris Golding over the last two or three weeks. Whilst he's had a solid start, the last two or three weeks have been phenomenal. Um, so I think he'd shot up to, to, to number one in the charts in popularity, but I just love the consistency of Milton Doyle uh, at both ends of the floor and his ability to create off the dribble um, for others and himself. Obviously, I just love Bryce. 
Um, and I think although he's off to a scratchy start, he's um, he's just building. And you could see that continue to build over the second half of the season. So I'm going to stay with Bryce Cotton. But a couple of other names, Luala Chul, uh, Patrick Miller. I like Lamb down in New Zealand, although I don't think his team's going to win enough games. I, I like Crawford in Tasmania. Alan Williams, I think you mentioned. Uh, Adams, is not, we've not seen the best of him yet. But, you know, that's coming. Um, he, he sees the building nicely. So he's putting up yeah. great numbers. If, if Brisbane start to convert some of those uh, close losses into victories, then you've got to try and find somebody to reward on that team. And, yeah, Creek, I think, probably, you know, the, the, the bottom end of the, the list that I've just mentioned. Um, but, you know, just his ability in the season he had last year and his numbers, are, uh, uh, you know, as far as efficiency are, are amazing. Uh-huh. Um, although he could be a little nicer at the free throw line at times. Uh-huh. But... Uh, and he does have a habit of shooting the ball really well in the first half of the season and then trailing off. So mm-hmm. I'm just keeping an eye on that to see how that goes in the second half. But, uh, yeah, I think I think those guys, we're going to find an MVP amongst yeah. that rabble that I just mentioned. <laughs> well, Cody, you did have Mitch, yeah. Mitch Craig at the start of the season. Who would you have right now? Like Simon, I have no idea, honestly. Mm. there's You're right. There, there's no clear-cut favourite, I think, at this point in the season where usually we've got one or two guys that we know, all right, they're going to be vying for the mm. MVP at the end of the season. There isn't really a clear cut, you know. Like someone said, Bryce started off a little rocky and not necessarily because of him, but just because yeah. of, of where they where he was placed in their system. And but yeah, look, Goulding has certainly skyrocketed for mm-hmm. sure. He's uh he's he's been awesome and he's been the mainstay for that Melbourne team this season. He's been the only one that's really stood out every single night yeah. and I mean he's been there every night as well, which is <laughs> which is fairly handy. Um look I expect Bryce to carry on with how he's been playing in, in the past few weeks and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll certainly be up there but my probably favorite would be Milton Doyle I think you know again like Simon said just the fact that he's he's really good on both ends of the floor and I know that's not really what they look for in MVPs mm. you know it, it's a lot of the time it's usually who puts the ball in the hole the most un- yeah. unfortunately but I, I just think he's he's so composed and he, he's He's never rushed. He, he's always making the right play. And, you know, when they're in those close games and it's in his, his hands, you're fairly confident that something good's going to happen every single time. Um, so if we were going to change it right now, I'd probably go with Doyle mm-hmm. um, as, as my MVP. I'd go Alan Williams, and I think mm-hmm. I think the fact that we've all picked someone different just goes to show how tough of a of a race race it is, and it, it's good fun. I mean, most of the most of the time we have a standout, or it's usually Bryce and maybe one other contender. Yeah. But it's it's nice to have so many content, contenders this season. So let's hope that continues. The next gen award, it's interesting. I think it's under twenty five. Yeah, twenty five and under Cody. So there's a lot of players in the mix. Simon, you had Luke Travis at the start of the season. He has to be in the mix still, doesn't he? This is another deep field. Uh, I think his all-round game, and he's always been a very good all-round player, but I think he's just a little bit better across the board again this season. I, I think you've got to have him uh, throwing an ill while, although his team's not doing well, so it might discount um, his production, but he's been very solid. Um, Bobby Clinton's been good. Uh, Bannon in Brisbane's been phenomenal, and I think he might be the dark horse in the second half of the season. And, and the other kid I, I really like is, when he was on the floor as Galloway and Sydney, uh, yep. I think he's a, a superstar in the making. Obviously, he's he, he's buddy there in Tui, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with Travis. I, I think he's a top three player right now on a, on a um, far and away the best team in the league. So I think that's pretty tough to beat. You had Sam Froling, Cody. Mm-hmm. You also thought Sam Froling should have won the award last year. Who would you pick right now? Uh, I mean, look, I thought in this award that they've put together he should have won it <laughs> yes, but I yes. think it was right that it you know it went the way it did last sure. year yep. after changing it mid-season yep. um, look I thought you know with with kind of what they put around Sam I thought that he might take another big leap this year mm. um, I don't think we've quite seen that and obviously things could change with, with Tatum now at the helm there yep. but look I mean it, it's hard for that to go that way when, when you've got a team winning you know, two or three games. So it, it's tough. And he's got, you know, a lot on his plate for sure. I think LT is, for me, he's probably the clear favourite when he's out on the floor for sure. Um, definitely a top two or three player on that championship contender, you know, as Simon alluded to. So I would probably change it to LT right now. Um, I think Alex Saar is someone who all eyes were on, mm-hmm. especially leading into the season. And I think he's doing really well when he's out there. Yeah. He's he's doing what 
his arse off, um, but he's not setting the world on fire. Mm. And, you know, LT's been in the league for a long time now. You know, he, he's used to playing this this kind of level and for such a young kid, it, it's very impressive. So, look, I think LT is, is probably who I would pick right now. I like Bobby Clinton as well, but mm-hmm. we probably haven't quite seen enough of him yet. So no. I'm going to go for Luke Travis. So that means we all agree <laughs> again. So um, best defensive player. I'd be actually surprised if we don't all agree on yeah. this one as well. You went Shaley at the start of the season, Simon. Um, without putting words in your mouth, I imagine you'll be sticking with that. I think there's, I think there's some real competition. And I, I'm going to stick with him, but I think there's real competition. I think there's some guys that are doing some wonderful things around the league. Um, Sam McDaniel up in Brisbane has been wonderful. Um, hopefully he stays healthy and, and gives himself an opportunity to, to at least make the... The, or be, come under consideration because I think that's been an issue for him previously is he's just not been able to stay on the floor. Uh, Daly hasn't been on the floor quite enough in recent times, but you know he's an elite defender. And yeah, for one, I, I, I love as a defender. And I actually had him in the top three last year. And shout out to all the friends in Sydney who would say that Justin Simon absolutely got robbed. I actually thought the defensive player of the year last year was Bull Qual and uh, is one that I'll be keeping an eye on for the remainder of the season as well as we watch uh, Cairns unfold. What do you think, Simon? I'm pretty, I mean, Cody, I mean, pretty sure you're not going to stick with Mango Mediang. Yes, no. <laughs> and this, look, this was part of, we did this when we were doing our NBA ones as yes, well and then, yep. you know, went and got mixed up and the NBA one <laughs> is certainly a big man's award whereas the NBL Defensive Player of the Year seems to be a guard's award so um, no look Shea is 100% for me probably on top of the leaderboard right now mm. and hoping that he stays injury free and that was always my question mark with Shea mm. which I mean is a fair question mark really given his history unfortunately and it's nice to have seen him out here for so long yes. already which is great but look I, I, I do think McDaniel's been Unbelievable as well. He he can kind of guard that one through four, or even just because of his yeah. extra size. And you know he, he's not given a whole lot away against you know the, the five men. No. Um, and he, and he can do it on a smaller guy like we saw in Bryce. Yes. Yeah. Well, and because he's smart, he's just super smart on the defensive end. And he, like I said, he's got that bigger frame. He, frame. He had a big off season by the looks, yep. and you know he's bigger and stronger. And look, I think Simon really hit the nail on the head with Bull Qual. I yes. think you know he's one of those guys that it gets talked about. His defense and and how much he brings for that can squad, but I don't think people understand just how good a defender he is. Because again, like just really smart. You know, he, he understands the game. He he knows the scouts. He knows who he's guarding and what what their go tos are. And again, his size just it makes he's, he's a pest on that mm-hmm. end of the floor. So look, I do think Shea is is leading the way at the moment. But yeah, he's certainly certainly got some people. Right behind him. Yeah, I'll stick with Shea as well, but I think there's competition as well. I think Tyrell Harrison is another one that'll be in the mm-hmm. mix. And if Will Magnet can stay healthy, he could put himself in the mix as well by by the, the end of the season. So it'll be interesting how it how it unfolds. Coach of the year. Coach of the year, Simon. You went with Scott Roth at the start. Who would you go with right now? Oh, I think the coach of the year to this point is by far and away Dean Richmond. Yeah. And... Having said that, I don't. I'm not discounting Scott Roth in the second half of the season. So, no, yeah. um, yeah, I think the, the job Dino. Look, I, I'm, I'm probably a little biased. Having you know, me and Dino grew up together, we've known each other forever, and I'm a huge fan of the way he goes about it. But I think what we've seen so far this year, and I know they're a very talented team, but what we've seen so far this year, I think it's his best performance so far as a head coach in the NBA. Uh, hard to argue. He'd be absolutely my pick right now. Um, what do you think, Cody? Yeah, look, it's almost impossible to argue, yep, right? Yep. He's the thing with teams loaded with talent is you know you've got guys on there that are used to being the go-to guy, mm. and and the fact that the fact that Dean has is done what he's done, and everyone's buying in, and they're all playing their role, and even right down to the to the young guys coming in, it, it just proves you know how good a, a culture he has there, yes. and and how how much he's invested into the squad and, and just is the team in general. So, look, I, I think Dean is, is far and away the, the winner right now. We all agree again. Yeah. <laughs> um, last one that I'll get get our thoughts on. Most improved player. This is a hard one preseason because we just don't know who's going to, to improve. But this is a fi- this is a pretty wide field again, I, I think. Um, I think off the top of my head, I had four guys that I was tossing up between. Simon, at the start of the season, you had Sam Wardenberg. Who would you have right now? 
Uh, I'm cancelling <laughs> Sam Wardenberg. Uh, he told me in the same as Cody there with uh, with Sam Froling in the in the next gen mm. situation that, that, that you're looking for that next step up, and it's probably been a little bit more of the same. The one thing I've liked about Sam's game this year is uh, I think his passing's uh, improved uh, even more, um, but his efficiencies have dropped. Um, he hasn't quite made the 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 improvement that I thought we'd see um, in, in the first half of the season. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've got it a dead heat right now. Yep. And and I'm going to throw a third guy in there who we just haven't seen enough of just yet. But I've, I've got Jordan Hunter. Mm-hmm. I've got Lat Mayern. And I've got my third one is Jalen Galloway if he can stay healthy in that second half of the season. I, I, can't, I really can't <laughs> split them because I can see my earns court time diminishing in the second half of the year once they get their, their health back. Yep. And I think he might drop back to the field. But I, I think what that two-headed monster in Sydney's done with, with, with uh, Hunter and, um, Bolden. and Bolden is phenomenal. And Geordie's putting up you know 26, 30-minute numbers in 20 minutes a game. Like, he, he's just been so productive. Um, and, yeah, he's just about doubled everything yeah. <laughs> this year. So he's been phenomenal. No, he has. Let's hope he's back healthy as well after this break. Cody, you went Isaac White. Who would you go right now? You keep letting Simon go on first <laughs> and he keeps stealing the uh, ideas. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it, for me, it, it's definitely Geordie Hunter. I think yep. I've mentioned it the last few weeks on the show that, you know, just just what he's doing and what he's stepped up and you know the, the role he's taken has, has been fun to watch and you know like I said his, his efficiencies have been so good this year and he's putting up some big numbers and he's just been so solid for him mm. he's uh he's playing like a veteran um yes. so yeah look he would he would be mine uh, for sure hunter was tough for me to overlook I, the four I was ended up ended up um, tossing up between were Tyrell Harrison Bull Kowal, Hiram Harris and Geordie Hunter. And now that you mentioned Lat Mayen, Simon, I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I definitely overlooked him because he's been terrific. But the one I ended up going for was Hiram Harris because he's virtually come from nothing to being almost the most important player on that Wildcats team. So um, I don't think there's any wrong answers. So it'll be interesting how the second half unfolds. Well, the tough thing for Hiram, right, is he doesn't set the stat sheet alive, yes, yes. right? And that's what you know I feel like these awards do is they yeah. pick the guys that stats are the best. For I guess diehards like the three of us that understand the game and and what impact players make, mm. you know he, he's I think he's certainly someone that shouldn't be overlooked. You're very kind putting me in the mix <laughs> with you and Simon, but I I won't put myself in that mix. But I think there's one other guy that we probably overlook um, perhaps a little bit, and, and he's putting together some of the most amazing shooting numbers. Maybe Ben Air at Southeast. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he's averaging just a, a hair under 10 points a game um, and shooting a three ball at uh, over 53%. So if he can keep those numbers up, then, yeah, that's he's had a phenomenal season. I, I dare say he's a step behind um, some of those other guys. Um, but, uh, yeah, he has had an extremely productive season to this point. No, you're right. And the concern I had for him was that he might not get as many opportunities going from Cairns to South East, but he's, he's found a really important role and he's, he's good fun to watch and... And you probably know this better than me, Simon. He's probably enjoying being back home. Yeah, I imagine so. He seems pretty chirpy, but he seems <laughs> chirpy at the best of time. <laughs> he, he does. He does. Um, all right, let's take a break, our last break on the show. When we come back, we're going to have a look at the retired jerseys to come at each club. Then we'll do a preview of, of round nine and wrap up the show. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm here with both Simon Mitchell and Cody Ellis. I thought this would be a fun discussion to have with the announcement that the Perth Wildcats are about to retire Damien Martin's number number 53, as we talked about last week, Cody. So I thought we'd go through all 10 clubs and see who we think would be the next number retired at each club. So some of them, like a South East Melbourne or a Tasmania, are still a, a new club. So this might be still a little while away until perhaps a current player ends up retiring. But we'll see see, here, see how we go. So it doesn't have to be someone that will be going up this year, but just who, who we think might be next at each, each team. Let's go through alph- alphabetically. The Adelaide 36ers, Cody, they've got... Some famous numbers up there. Daniel Johnson is now, is now up there, so mm. he's the newest name up there. But 
Does anyone jump out that you think they might have missed so far? Look, not off the top of my head, really. Um, you know, this is something that I didn't get a, a good enough time to, <laughs> no. to have a look into, unfortunately. But um, look, I'll, I'd probably look at them. I'm going to look at these more of current players that could possibly go up. And Adelaide don't really have mm. any current players no. that I could see going up there anytime soon. You would have um, said Daniel Johnson if he had Well, up yeah, and the fact that already. he went up basically <laughs> the day after he said he's not coming back is, is uh, I mean, a testament to him and, and what he did for that club. Or well, maybe but, after uh, he was told he wasn't yeah, coming back. Well, yeah, yeah. However that went down. Yes. But, uh, yeah, no, it's a, in, in terms of current players that uh, that may go up in the future, I, I can't really see anyone. Mm. What do you think, Simon? Anyone jump out that the Sixers don't have up there just yet? Oh, there's one name which I, I'm a bit of a head scratcher for me. Um, I, firstly, I, I'm just going to say, like, I, I think the retiring of the jersey is the bigger honour as you can get. Yep. And some of the names I'm going to throw up there are probably a little premature um, in the sense I don't truly believe that they should have their number retired. But uh, this one, this man, I certainly do. And uh, I, I don't know how he's been overlooked, but Mike Mackay. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was a, a wonderful player in Adelaide for a long, long time, playing their uh, championship team in 86 was at West Adelaide before that. Long-time stalwart, heavy, heavy scorer on some very, very good Adelaide teams. I'm not sure how his career in Adelaide finished and whether or not it finished on the best of terms because this is going back a long way, but I've got a feeling that he may have been contracted and he, he left or he was allowed to leave or he ended up in Brisbane, I think, uh, at the end of his days. But uh, So I'm not sure how that all ended up. But uh, you know, for players back in the day who were extraordinarily productive, and, and, and I think he might have been an Olympian. I think he might have been on our no, 92 was, team. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a national team representative, um, high profile, long time servant of the club. I, I would thought Ad- uh, Adelaide Thirty uh, Sixers would have uh, raised his uh, number into the rafters by now. The name that stood out to me, and I'm a little bit biased because I know him so well, but I, I, I would go Scott Ninnis. I know he he feels like he's not deserving of the honour, but I think as the as I always keep telling him, he's the only man that's been involved with every championship the Thirty Sixers have, have won, either as an assistant coach or a player, and I think. I think he deserves to be to be up in the mix, and you would have bumped into him a fair bit over the years, Simon. Lovely man, uh, and, and yeah, I, I strongly considered Scott as well. He, he'd be well and truly would be thrilled with that honour, I think, and I think the people of Adelaide would be would be thrilled and and, and think of him as being a most deserving uh, uh, name to be up there. Wonderful player. Mm. Brisbane Bullets, Cody. Uh, they've only got four names up there at the moment. Anyone jump out that? You can think of? Uh, look, again, I'll, I'm going from current players that may, yes. whereas you two can go a lot more into the history than I can. Yep. Um, look, the only real one that is kind of, and this is probably whether he can take them to a championship in the next few years, is probably going to be a guy like Sobes mm-hmm. that has been through a bit of the dregs in the last season, the mm-hmm. last few seasons with them, um, and... It has been a big part of, of why they've they've gotten to where they are, um, for sure, now. But, uh, yeah, look, he, he's still got a, a heck of a lot of work to do if, if that's uh, going to happen. What do you think, Simon, of the Bullets? Uh, yeah, I, I would think it's unlikely that we're going to see any new additions to that four, yeah. to be honest. Um, unless Sobes is the only one that comes to mind and he'd have to sort of have a next next five years be really good and I think he's on the wrong side of thirty. So being a you know, a man who's played at three clubs and, and quite prominent there in uh, in Adelaide. Mm. Yeah, I think it might be a stretch for him. Um the other one that and you mentioned his name earlier, he might be a bit of a dark horse is Tyrell Harrison now. I say that because he's been there a long time. He has, yeah. Um but he's still only a young man and we've seen his development almost weekly at the moment. And uh, if he was to, you know, continue his um, his trajectory and maintain that for another five, six, seven seasons in Brisbane, um, and they find some success there, I, I could see I could see him uh, potentially uh, joining those names up in uh, up in the stand. The only one that's that sprung to my mind, and I know he played at a few clubs, was. And maybe I'm, I'm only thinking of it because he's on my TV screen so often at the moment. It's Derek Rucker. Yep. He might be one that did spring to mind, but he's had a little bit of a checkered history as well, so I'm not sure. But he's the only one that sort of sprung to mind from the history of the Bullets. The Cairns Taipans. Right now they've only got one name up there, Aaron Graveau. Anyone jump out that might be next, Cody? Uh, look, uh, really the only one that I can think of is probably Alex Loughton and, yes. and what 
uh, and look, not necessarily for everything he did on the court. He was awesome for the club on the court. But I think the engagement he got within the community up in Cairns was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact that he was he was a big part in, in why, um, you know, it was always tough going up there and playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, a, a big part of, of why the club was uh, was at such a high level for a long time. So, look, I think he's probably the first one that swings to mind for me. What do you think, Simon? Yeah, well, I, I couldn't really think of it. Loughton and Nature Y were the only two names that yep. sort of came to my mind. Yep. But I didn't think either of them were really the sort of player that's going to be honoured in that way. Yep. I, I, Nate, obviously, hometown boy um, and a huge, huge figure and character in, in, in the town account. But I'm not sure his career um, warranted, his career in Cairns warranted um, the, the, the honour of having his number retired. Oh. Alex Loughton was a wonderful player for a long time, a great stalwart. But I've crystal balled this one. Okay. I, I, I actually thought I'd work my magic in the dark arts here and see <laughs> him in a few. And uh, Bull Cole's got that three-year mm, deal. <laughs> Well, I, I, I looked into the future and I saw another three-year extension on top of that and uh, potentially, yeah. well, might be that guy. They've got a history of players going there, doing well, and then leaving. Mm. Bull stayed. Yes. And uh, if he's able to build on his start to his career, then he's one that maybe one day we could see uh, have his number raised up into the rafters. No, I like it. Yeah, um, I love it. Alex Loudon is the one I, I, I went with and... Again, that might be just because of the history I've got with him, so I'm a little a little bit biased. But I I think as a as a captain who took his team to two grand final series and everything that he did at the type ends, I think the number forty wouldn't be out of place, especially when I guess the bar was set with Aaron Grabo as a as a good culture team man, not necessarily necessarily a superstar. So yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing Lousy go up there. Illawarra Hawks, so they've got a great history. There's one recently retired player that mm. did spring to mind for me. Anyone for you, Cody? Yeah, Timmy Conrad, I mm. think, is probably the next one to go up there. Um, again, just a big figure in the, in the Illawarra region, and I think he ended up slotting up into third in the all-time games mm. played for yeah. the Hawks. Uh, um, only behind Savile and Campbell. Yeah, yeah, which are two pretty big names, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, look, he was pretty much the only one that really sprung to mind yes. for me. What do you think, Simon? Uh, yeah, no, Timmy came to mind. The other names that I had to sort of rack at, uh, Oscar Foreman's one, mm-hmm. yeah, um, yeah. who played for the Hawks for a long time. And uh, I dare say if, if, if Timmy's at three, then Oscar's got to be four, mm. top five at least. Yeah. Um, and, well, and the other, uh, he played well, at least 450 in total, didn't he? So at least 300 so. were at Illawarra. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, he was there a long, long time. And, and people forget just how incredibly gifted Oscar was. You know, he's a younger man, you know, a bit of an athlete, but uh, drop dead shooter. And, I mean, he made the – he was ahead of his time with that stretch four position. So, um, yeah, like, like Timmy, they're both wonderful servants of the club. Um, the only other name that came to mind that was a long-time servant was, was Reese Martin. Um who probably played eight or nine seasons at Illawarra. I'd have to check into that. But, uh, but yeah, he was there as a long-time servant. But, again, you know, I'm not sure he was quite the, the level of a player. That, that he always a very, very good, solid player, but maybe not uh, quite good enough to have his number retired. Another former team of yours, I think, Coach? Yeah, I was lucky enough to play with all three of those guys. Yeah. Um, Oscar Foreman would annoy the absolute crap out of me because be, I'd be in the gym every day in the off-season working on a shot, and he'd... <laughs> be away in Europe for the entire <laughs> off-season and come back and just absolutely destroy me in any shooting games we ever played. So, no, one of the all-time great shooters is a big for sure. Yeah. Tim Conrad was the one that sprung to mind for me uh, just because he played his whole career at the Hawks. Melbourne United is an interesting one. So I don't know if they can go back and retire guys from the Melbourne Tigers days or if they would only do it for Melbourne United players. So I'm not sure what their criteria would be. They haven't retired anybody um, since this new era. So Mark Bradkey, I think, was the last one that they did did retire. Um, who springs to mind, Cody? I mean, Chris Gordy would be mm. the guy. Yep. I mean, he's even back to when they were the Tigers. Yes. You know, he was he was leading from the front. Um, but I think something that probably doesn't get talked about a whole lot is, is, is a coach that sticks around. And I think Dean mm. needs to have something mm. up there at some point um, at the end of his career because mm. the, the things those two have done for, for that club um, has been unbelievable. This one's close to your heart, Simon. What do you think? Well, if we're going to have three coaches in the as well, and I've probably got Lindsay and Westover, you probably have to consider as well. Yes, uh, very much. So. 
I've got three guys. Chris is the obvious one. Mm. It, you know, he's the obvious, and we're all lauding his wonderful season this year. David Barlow, um, especially with the obstacles he had to overcome. Three-time NBL champion with Melbourne Tigers slash Melbourne United um, over, over 11 seasons. So, I mean, you know, you look at some of the names that have had their number retired, he, he certainly stacks up very well against them. And, and there's one that oh, I think needs to be rectified, um, and that's Chris Anthony. Yep. He's dominant. That Melbourne Tigers was the equal of anybody, any any player that's played in our league. He was a two-time MVP, two-time champion, two-time championship series MVP, a defensive player of the year, four-time All-NBL first team um, in, in his time at Melbourne. It's and I think man. it's, think, you know, he's in the top handful of players we've had in the league. And um, I know he spent some time across the, uh, across the uh, Yarra at uh, South East Melbourne magic um, but his time with the Tigers um, is needs to be acknowledged and I, I think his number needs to be retired I was actually surprised that it hadn't been yeah. when, when I was looking looking into this I think you know Anstey is the obvious one and like you said I do hope that's rectified soon and, and then as soon as he retires Chris Golding just has to mm-hmm. has to go up there as well there's a really obvious one that's not up there at the New Zealand breakers as well I'll be interested interested to see if you guys both have the same name. Give me the first go, Cody. Yeah, it has to be Mika Vakona, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has to be. I know he's kind of bounced a little bit around in his coaching staffs with, with different yeah. clubs now, but I mean, really, whenever I think of New Zealand, I think of I think of Mika. Yes. So it's uh yeah, that should be up there fairly shortly, I'd assume. Uh, I think he took it as an insult when RJ Hampton wore his number fourteen yeah, I'm a sure. couple of years back. So I so I don't know if the club and he are on great terms, but mm. at the same time, he is the heart and soul of that whole organisation. What do you think, Simon? Oh, it's a no-brainer. Um, Mick is one of the, one of the players I admire most. Three-time NBL champion with the Breakers, uh, two-time All NBL second team, and played thirteen seasons there. And um, if anybody got absolutely every single thing out of their body, it was Mika, yeah, and um, and he gave it for that club and, and some others. But um, yeah, I, I agree with Cody. Like, just you think of the breakers. Um, I think of Mika. He's just a he is to New Zealand basketball. I think what Damien Martin is to uh, to the Perth Wildcats. Yep, absolutely. And I I've told him this a few times, and he gets a little bit awkward about it when I say it because he's a very self effacing character. But he's always going to be my favourite NBL player. I just admired him so much and. He just has to be has to be retired, and then as soon as he retires, Tom Abercrombie has yeah, to has to go, go sure. up there as well. So I mean, I, I, Chris, I might throw one other name at you then. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Tom Abercrombie is an absolute Monty, mm-hmm. um, four time champion, and this this one might be a little controversial, but uh, Kirk Penny. Oh, uh-huh. absolutely. absolutely, that's a, yep, it's a good one. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. In time at New Zealand. Yeah, he was, he was an NBL champion, just the yes. one championship. He was an MVP, a three-time scoring champ, and a four-time All NBL first team. Whilst with the break, is uh, those are some pretty impressive numbers, yeah. and uh, certainly uh, CJ is there. And I know CJ played a few more seasons than him in New Zealand, but but I, I would think that Kirk was right up there with the best of the New Zealand Breakers players of all time, and uh, I think he should probably get it some acknowledgement as well. Is yeah. he another former team under your? He York, certainly is. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, it's been a handful of guys that. Uh, Fairly impressive resumes that I've played with. <laughs> the Perth Wildcats. So it had been a long time since anyone joined your dad, Cody, mm-hmm. up until the last two years. We're now the scoring machine's up there and Damien Martin will soon be up there. Who will be next? This is a tough one, right? Because there was, I think, six names up there for a mm-hmm. long, long time. And then Sean, obviously, absolutely deserved. Damo, again, an absolute no-brainer. Mm-hmm. But then within the next probably 10 to 12 years, we're going to see probably less than that, really, depending on how long they play for. We'll, we'll see Jesse go up there, yep. and then we'll probably see Bryce go up there. Yep. And that's four big names that mm. have played in all would have played together, mm. you know, at some point. Yep. So, again, a couple of no-brainers there. But, um, yeah. What do you think, Simon? Uh, I agree. Uh, Jesse, without a doubt, six-time champion. And just 14 seasons with one club is pretty impressive. Uh, Bryce Cotton. Seven seasons with one club, three-time champ, two-time NBL grand final, three MVL MVPs, and six-time All NBL first team, and six scoring champions, and the greatest player I've seen in the NBL. So he's an absolute Monty. Um, yeah, look, they've got a tremendously 
tremendously proud Heritage Perth. Um, I just wonder if you, if our compadre Matty Knight might sneak a sneak a jersey up there too at some time. Mm. What do you think, Cody? Yeah, it's a tough one, right? Because mm. you know, I mean, bloody hell. Their whole roster could have, <laughs> yeah. you know, that little stretch they had, that their whole damn roster could have almost yeah. made it up there. But, uh, yeah, look, Matty was absolutely um, someone that you, you definitely spring to mind when you thought of the Perth Wildcats, mm. you know, in his time with the, with the Cats. And he was such a big part of what they did, both on the offense and defensive yeah. end. And he was, you know, he, he earned the name Nightmare for a reason. Yes. I always introduce him as the best power forward of his generation. I, I, I think he, he really was because I think he, he was a, a real game changer. But, um I don't know, maybe longevity is the only thing mm-hmm. counting against him. And he, unfortunately, his body just didn't allow him to keep playing. But three three championships speaks for itself. Um, South East Melbourne Phoenix. So this might be still a little while away. Anyone spring to mind, though, Cody, who would be the first name to go up there? Uh, yeah, look, if it's just going to be solely the Phoenix, mm. then you'd probably go with Creaky. Yep. Um, he, he would be the first one to, to spring to mind, really, especially if he can get them a championship or two. Yeah. Interesting to get your take on this one, Simon. Creaky can lead a team to a championship. It's an absolute Monty. I I, I just think it uh, it happens. I'd like to see him play at least another 100 games for the Phoenix. You mm-hmm. probably want to see if I play 200 odd games for for their club to 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 get to be you know eligible to have their their number put up or at least close to. And uh, yeah, so I think there's probably a few more seasons there for Creaky. Um, but yeah, I think he's I think he's a legitimate chance. But uh, you, you just I think a championship makes it undeniable, um, or even just uh, you know a couple of grand final series. I think it it, it just it happens. But yeah, um, sure. yeah, I hope it happens for Mitch, and I certainly hope it happens for the club. Yeah, no, for sure. Mitch Craig's the only one that I thought of as well. But again, this this is something that we'll just have to crystal ball and wait and see. Sydney Kings do things differently, so they. Don't retire their numbers. They've got the, I think it's called the Wall of Champions. Probably. Yeah, it's, um, they're just kind of banners. Yeah, so they've, they've got quite a few names up there, and one of them that's not up there any, anymore, <laughs> as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> anyone stick out, Cody, that might be joining those those people up there? Well, again, it's tough because I feel like Sydney's been a bit of a revolving door of players, mm. right? You know, if we see Zave come back and stay yeah. stick around for quite a few years to come, I, I think he's got bigger things on his mind. But, you know, if we see someone like Zave come back and really dominate the league the way he did for that, you know, stretch that he did, then he's certainly a possibility. But, you know, looking into the crystal ball a bit, you know, now that Simon's done that earlier, <laughs> yeah. you know, a, a guy like, you know, Geordie Hunter, who is, mm. again, his upward trajectory has been really good um, for the few years he's been there and yeah. another younger guy that, yeah, he's got a pretty bright future. Anyone jump out for you, Simon? Um... Yeah, no, there's a couple of names that um, I'll go with. And just looking at some of the names that they have there, uh, I'm going to go with Chris Pongrass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they, they, I think when you, you look at this era and the turnover of players and the turnover, turnover of coaches, he's been the constant and he's been so responsible for their success, um, probably more so than anybody else. Um, the only other name being Xavier Cooks, yes. be responsible for the most recent success. But they were good before he got there, and they've been good since he's left too. So yes. Chris Pongrass, and the, again, just because they they like to do things from left field, I, I think his name was Laurie Watterson. Yes, it was. Yes. <laughs> he was the guy. Yeah, he was the guy who used to, to be around there shaking everyone's hand and. <laughs> Like he was a big part of the, the culture there and, um, you know, like they like to acknowledge those sorts of people. So p- perhaps uh, he gets a nod as well. But as far as players, I, I think um, I think uh, Cody's covered it. It's just been turnover and, like, their superstars probably haven't stayed for quite long enough to, to get the nod. Um, maybe Geordie is that guy who, um, who can hang around a few extra years and get that gong. But, uh, but right now, um, Chris Pongas is, is, is the, the front runner for me. No, that's a great call. The only player that's, that came to mind for me was another former teammate of yours, Cody, Kevin Lish. Mm-hmm. I thought you'd say that, actually. <laughs> yeah, look, and again, I, I just don't think he, he played long enough. For, but but for... I feel like maybe their criteria is a little bit less than some yeah. clubs because they're not necessarily retiring the number. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And look, going back to 
Laurie Watterson as well. I think the club actually has an award named after Loz at mm. the moment. So, yeah, look, he was certainly someone that was around the club for a long, long time <laughs> and uh, did a lot of the background work for him. Tasmania Jack Jumpers. So we're going to have to crystal ball this one as well. Because yeah. Three years in, you can't really retire somebody's number just yet. But does anyone spring it to mind on this current team, Cody, that you imagine might be the first player? You'd probably go with Clint yeah. Steindl. Yeah. Um, look, played a big chunk of his career elsewhere, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, he, he's, he's certainly done an amazing job of, of instilling a, a culture within, mm. you know, uh, along with Scott Roth, uh, uh, instilling that culture in the Tassie well, community mm. as well as, as the team. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how many years he's got left in his legs. Yeah. But, yeah, look, he's probably the first one that really springs to mind for me. Anyone jump out for you? With the Jack Jumpers, Simon? Yeah, well, I actually didn't even think of Clint. I, I, I had to peek into the crystal ball on this one because, it, you know, um, the season's in. I think Jack McVeigh is the perfect uh, fit for that club, and I would think he never should never leave. Mm. Um, I think he embodies what they do down there. He's not the most orthodox player. He's not the greatest athlete running around the NBL but he certainly works extraordinarily hard um, on his game and on his preparation and the way he conducts himself. He's a, I don't know the kid very well, not at all actually, but he seems to be a bit of an offbeat character, a little different. <laughs> um, and I think that it, it certainly is um, is appreciated by the, uh, the Tasmanian um, folk down there. So I'm going to go with Jack, but I also... For whatever reason it is, I think Milton Doyle's going to play a lot of years for, yeah. for Tassie Jack Chappers. So. I, I think he's just got the personality. He seems to be very comfortable there. I, I actually think there was a bit of a smoke screen going on last year about the lack of urgency that the Jack Jumpers showed about trying to find a replacement for mid Milton Doyle when he didn't sign straight away indicated to me that they knew where he, he had signed. He just that I'm going to get, he had already signed. They just couldn't announce it because he was playing overseas. And, you know, agents don't like that being announced while you've got no unit, molly uniform on. So I believe he was an early committer to the Jack Jumpers, which means he cares about that club. And if he cares about that club and he plays, a, you know, he gets through another couple of contracts there, we'll see his numbers in the, uh, in the rafters. Total, totally agree. I mean, if if both Milton and Jack finish their careers in Tasmania, they'll be the best best two ever players of the club in their in their history. And Clint Steinle, I think, does deserve that recognition just because if you listen to Scott Roth talk and he signed him to be, be that culture guy and to be that leader and to be their first ever captain, he hasn't put up the numbers that you would, I guess, usually expect for a guy that gets an honour like that. But I think for the the tone that he set in building that culture, I think I think Clint as their first ever captain might might get that honour as well. That was a fun discussion, guys. Thanks for putting your thinking caps on for that. But we're quickly running out of time. Let's race through our Round 9 preview, thanks to to Tap Touch. Gets back underway Thursday night. The wounded New Zealand Breakers without Will McDowell-White and Zylan Cheatham against the Adelaide 36ers looking to build some momentum. I'll go to get your thoughts first, Cody. Uh, yeah, look, uh, Adelaide go into this as underdogs, actually, which is... It's surprising mm. for mine. Mm. Um, I would expect that they come out and, and get this win for sure. What do you think, Simon? I don't disagree with Cody. Um, and we've already seen Adelaide go down to New Zealand and win. Yeah. But I certainly haven't learnt my lesson because I'm tipping the Bakers. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Doubleheader Friday night. Cairns Taipans, and let's hope for the first time they'll be at full strength. So let's hope that Bobby Clintman is is good to go. Brisbane Bullets will be at full strength as well. They'll get Shannon Scott back for this game as well. The old Sunshine Stoush. I'll, I'll start with you, Simon. Yeah, I'm going for Brisbane on the road in this one. Um, the one thing I've learned over the years is when you, when you lose a lot of players is that you can survive. You can keep ticking it over and, and getting a couple of wins here and there. It's actually really difficult to start fitting everyone back into the team again. So you go through the transition of losing them then the transition of bringing them back. I don't think we're going to see the best of Cairns just yet. And I think the fever break's been really good for Brisbane. I think they're uh, they're going to come back with uh, a little bit of a point to prove. I think, Cody? Yeah, look, I 100% agree with everything there. Uh, I think Brizzy probably had a good little week off here and, and really got after it. And uh, I think they'll be ready and raring to go. Um, and tab touch multis, I think. Yes. Uh, I'm sticking with Brizzy. Yes. And you are on a winning streak as well, Cody, that continued last week with your NBA multi. 
This looks to be the game of the round for me. The Perth Wildcats at home to the Sydney Kings. The Wildcats on a five-game winning streak. The Kings with a great recent record against the Wildcats and looking to bounce back from that loss to, to Melbourne. We'll start, with, start with you, Cody. Yeah, look, this is going to be an interesting one. I think it's going to be uh, one of the better games. And uh, look, Perth obviously playing a lot better basketball. You know, we've seen uh, their rotations kind of change and shorten a little bit. Look, they've, they've been a lot better to watch. And I think letting guys like Bryce get loose and, and do what he does has, has been good. But uh, look, I, I think Sydney is going to get this one. I, I just think that the way that their team's put together, I think they've probably just got the wood over the cats a little mm. bit. Yeah, look, I expect it to be a, a fun game. Simon? I'm going with Cody on this one. Um, I, I agree. I just think uh, Styles make bikes, and, and this one's a, a little bit of a, a tough one for me um, as to which way it'll go. But I'm going with Sydney. I just don't know if Perth have enough players who'll be able to stay in front of theirs with the way that Sydney attack the paint. So they're also a much improved offensive rebounding team, the Kings, this year, and they'll challenge them. Perth have been good. I'm going to tip the hat. They've been good on the boards, but I think Sydney will challenge them there. I'm just going to go the Kings on this one. And that was exactly where Sydney dominated them last time the two teams yeah. played as well. So I think I think it's a, a good call. Um, two more games on Saturday. Now, the South East Melbourne Phoenix, first up at home to the New Zealand Breakers. Simon, I'll start with you. Do the Phoenix bounce back? Uh, yes, I think they bounce back or either New Zealand just won't be good enough to beat them. Um, one of the two, but I'm, I'm, I'm backing South East Melbourne on this one. They played them earlier in the year. Um, New Zealand came off a game earlier in the night, uh, early in the week, travelled to Melbourne. They didn't look good against the Phoenix. Phoenix com- comfortably beat them. So I, I'm, I'm going to say that form sticks. Cody? Yeah, I totally agree. And playing on Thursday and then turning around to, to a Saturday game is, is always tough. So. Why do the breakers always get these they, specials? Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> I mean, that's part of living across a body of water, right? Um, no, look, I, I think the Phoenix are just too good, honestly. Um, and New Zealand are missing too many key pieces. And, uh, yeah, Phoenix will get that one. I'll stick with you, Cody. Tasmania Jack Jumpers at home to the Adelaide 36ers. Well, yeah, and Adelaide, you know, playing on the back of a double as well. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Tassie get this one. I just think... This fever break's probably been good for them and Scott Roth to kind of instill that defensive mindset a bit again. You know, he, he'd spoken about it just before the, the fever break came in that they don't have that same bite that they've kind of once had. Um, so I think that's probably what their main focus was and I just think they'll lock up Adelaide. What do you think, Simon? Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm going the jack jump. Uh, one of the things about wanting to be a good defensive team is you need good defensive players. You can you can talk it up all you want. Um, you can you can train it all you want. If you don't have the players who are, you know who have the ability to hike up the shorts and, and get the job done, it doesn't matter. Now the Jack Jumpers are not as strong defensively, but they now have a get out of foul free card and Will Magne. Yes. And uh, I think the the form that he's shown so far, I think that he's going to cover or smooth over a few of those cracks that uh, that appear once in a while. So I'm, I'm back on the Jack Jumpers here. Last two games on a Sunday. First up, we've got Melbourne United against the Cairns Taipans, and I, I imagine Melbourne will have both Daly and Ian Clark back, so they'll be they'll be raring to go. Um, I'll stick with you, Simon. What do you think? Yeah, Melbourne. Melbourne for mine. Um, just far and away the class team in the competition right now. Cody? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And look, you know, Simon spoke about you know Cairns in, in slotting in those those pieces yeah. um, after losing them. I think. The difference with Melbourne is is you're slotting into you know veterans that understand their role mm-hmm. and you know uh, the ultimate professionals. So I don't think that affects them too much at all. Um, but you're right. I think Melbourne get this one. Last game of the round. I'll stick with you, Cody. The Brisbane Bullets back at home against the Illawarra Hawks, playing their first game of the weekend, second game under Justin Tatum. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they go after a week off with you know just on the training court with, with Tatum. So um, look. Showed some good signs um, in their first game and, you know, obviously came out with the win, which was good. Uh, but I think Brisbane get this one. What do you think, Simon? It's not the same old Illawarra Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I'm afraid I think we're going to see them on Sunday. I think Brisbane get this one. I can't believe I just picked Brisbane for two wins, so they're moving no, no. to that fourth spot. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think the Bullets at home to Illawarra, I think that's, uh, that's your best bet. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. All right, so... Head to Tab Touch, get on the Tab Touch app or tabtouch.com.au and check out those odds as the weekend gets closer and check out your exclusive, Cody, as well, because you're 
you're on a winning streak, and that means you have to stop, have to make sure you don't bet on them because you'll you'll jinx them. Yeah, I'm staying well clear because you're right. You know, like I've said, anytime I'd put any money on it, it'd be uh, an, an automatic loser. So uh, staying away for all you guys out there. All right, um, that's been a big show, a lot to cover, even though we didn't have any games to talk about, mm-hmm. guys. So Simon, thanks very much for joining us. It's always fun to to pick your brain and. I'll get your final thoughts. What are you most looking forward to from the NBL action coming back this week? I'm just loving the young players this year. I think the next stars that we've had on the floor have been wonderful. Um, so, yeah, Saar, Clintman, Flowers, Huck Hordy, um, Tui, even the younger guys like Bannon, Galloway and Cameron. Um, but they'll be United who aren't necessarily next stars. Just those kids. It's fun to watch. They make me, they make me feel old, but I also <laughs> I just love watching them play. Uh, absolutely well said Uh, i'll sign off and cody you can have the final say yeah no look uh simon thank you so much mate for uh for jumping on with us and and taking a hour and a half out of your time it was a lot of fun to uh, have a chat to you mate and pick your brain a bit and hopefully everyone enjoys the show it uh it was certainly a good one he'll make it for sure now that's why I backed him on Tap Touch. Hey, Luke. Yes, Gene Simmons. He is probably the best when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Gene. You've got the touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call 1 800 858 858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au.